All right, welcome along to the RT Soccer World Cup podcast. Raf Giallo here, and we know the identity of one of the World Cup finalists, and it's Argentina after beating Croatia 3-0. And we're recording just after that semi-final. And to chat about that and also look ahead to France against Morocco in the second semi-final, I'm joined by RT Sport Online editor Mikey Stafford and Ireland legend Ray Houghton. And uh, Mikey, to you first, I suppose, after the first half hour in this game, I mean the way it actually ended up being a 3-0 that was wasn't exactly what I was expecting I was kind of expecting another kind of tense hour of football probably go into extra time especially given that it's Croatia and probably pe- uh, penalty shootout at the end as well yeah having uh having had uh what seven extra time uh extra time matches in their last eight knockout games at World Cups Croatia yeah probably probably we're looking to uh, looking ahead to another uh long evening um I'm just looking at the timeline on the FIFA website here. There's literally nothing, not a booking, nothing, a uh, shot on goal, etc. until the 32nd minute. And then there's just this flurry, flurry of activity. Um, it was, yeah, it escalated very quickly there uh, in the late in the first half. And it just seemed, Argentina just seemed to be, look back, they've scored first in every game so far. Um and they were obviously tipped by a lot of people at the start, and then they lost to Saudi Arabia in their first game, which kind of let the air out of the balloon a bit. But if you look at them since, it's been a very steady, steady progression, which I suppose in tournament football is what you want. And, and now you'd have to say the team going into the final on Sunday look like a completely different outfit from the one that lost to Saudi Arabia, or even beat Mexico or beat Poland. They are just they're growing into the tournament, which is exactly what you want. Yeah, and Ray, I suppose uh, Messi can still write a glorious final chapter, but this these particular pages, the semi-final books, it's all going to be about him. I mean, yes, he only scored the uh, penalty, I say only, but uh, you could feel his fingerprints on the on all three goals in the end. Well, it, particularly the third one, you know, that was vintage Messi, wasn't it? Where he picked the ball up the right-hand side, uh, showed a real burst of pace to get beyond the uh, Croatian back line. And then he's just got this way of using his upper body strength to get beyond people who are taller, look like they're stronger, but he, just his low centre of gravity get, gets him away from pe- people. And then the vision and awareness to pick out Alvarez with a little cutback, and he was never going to miss from there. I thought Alvarez was excellent. I thought his running in behind was a feature uh, when um, Argentina started to get a foothold in the game because of the two, Croatia started the better. You know, they, they, they look more comfortable and possessionable. Without being a threat, you know, I don't think they really had too many shots to go through the 90 plus minutes. Um, but they looked assured in possession. That wasn't a problem for them. But when Argentina just upped their game and started to play with a different tempo, they just couldn't live with them. And the defence got caught out with being a little bit uh, square, all getting played in behind. And Alvarez's pace was a, was a problem for them. And what did you make of how Argentina set up uh, at the beginning and also Croatia? Because everything was sort of packed into the middle. Argentina out of possession was clearly they were sort of 4 4 2. But then obviously Messi sort of drops in and then Alvarez is given free reign uh, to run through. But uh, the two wide midfielders seem to be very tucked in as well because they're not natural wingers. Well, they're not. When you look at McAllister and DePaul, they would probably be central midfielders. You know, they'd want to be in a more central position more often than not. It's a bit alien for them to go wide. But I think that's where they got the width um, was through the two fullbacks. They loved him to, to get forward and express themselves in the wide areas. But I, I just think once they got the first goal, I never, I never thought Croatia were going to get back into it. I, I don't think they score enough goals for one. I think that if you look at their stats throughout the tournament, they're not some, they're not a team that score lots and lots of goals. They're a team that keeps possession, they wear you down and then they might win it by a goal to nil or as we've seen with penalty shootouts, but they're quite adept at But Argentina, and there was a lot made of their defeat to Saudi Arabia. They were gone, they weren't very good and you've just seen the difference where you've got a decent team, good team, but you've got a superstar and he can switch it on, not as much as he once could, but still to the effect where he can change a game score goals, create goals, and, you know, he's beat Batistuta's record now. He was equal with him. He's got his goal tonight, which he's taken one ahead of him. Um, he could end up being the uh, top goal scorer at the World Cup, and he could eventually win the trophy that's missing from his CV. 
So I think if you've seen him I've, in this tournament, I've seen a difference with Messi. I think he's a bit more focused. You know, he's a bit more with the team. Um, yes, there are times when the players are trying to get him the ball when it's not always on to do so. But they look more of an outfit. And one of the things they did tonight, so in the previous match, they went to a back five to match the Dutch. This time they actually went we are back four. So this is the manager, Scaloni, thinking on his feet what he's, what he's doing. He knows what system he should play against each uh, opposition that's going to get the best out of them. That's clever management. And the players have to accept he's going to make these changes. But he's making the changes for the good of the team because he believes that's the best way to go and get, uh, get the victory. Yeah, and what was a chess match in terms of the, ch- the initial checkmate was the penalty um, on 34 minutes. So this is uh, Julian Alvarez running through and Livakovic, who's been a great goalkeeper for Croatia in this tournament, then collides with him. Uh, Ray, what was your take on it? Because I suppose for myself, I think it, was a stone I thought it was harsh. I yeah. thought it was oh, very harsh. Yeah. And the only reason why is I can understand this contact, but Alvarez is going at such pace that once he puts it past the keeper, he's, he's got his momentum is going to take him into the goalkeeper. So did the goalkeeper get in his way to foul him? Was it just a collision with two lads, one going one way, one going another? You can't make yourself invisible. Now, I think that's why I've seen a lot on social media and I know a lot of uh, ex-players on TV have said, no way, it was a penalty. And others are going, what are you doing? Of course there was contact. Well, there's always going to be contact on a football field. It's, was it intentional? You know, did he try to take him out? And I thought it was a little bit harsh. I can understand when people say there was contact. I get it. I understand it. But just from a perspective, of was there any intent from the keeper? I don't think there was, personally. And um, that's why I thought it was a little bit harsh. But what a penalty. I mean, he couldn't have hit it any harder. I mean, the pace he got on the straight was phenomenal. And he went past the goalkeeper, as you said, the form that he's been in. And I think the keeper guessed it right. He couldn't get anywhere near it. I mean, he was, he was hitting the back of it and coming back out as he was diving. Just such was the quality. And that gave them the perfect start. Yeah, and as you said, Mikey, I think uh, in the, uh, in, I suppose, our work chat, uh, you know, if you're wearing gold boots, you sort of have to earn it. And <laughs> he certainly, certainly did. Oh, he did. Um, and I, I could sit here and rhapsodize about his skill all evening and the way he made a man 15 years old, younger than him look like he was a pensioner with, you know, two artificial hips at the end there. But what was really different about Messi this time around is there's a few, like 2014, he scored in three successive World Cups. I think he's the first player in about 60 years now to score in three successive matches in two separate World Cups. So he's still doing lots of things that he did before. But what he is doing that does seem different, that separates him from the 2014 Messi, who looked a bit tired and a bit distant from his teammates. He's clearly the leader now. But also, he's an archy little git. He's getting in the referee's face constantly. He's, he's jawing all the time. We saw what he did. Obviously, with the Dutch at the end of the game, when that but that game was just bonkers. But today as well, he's the guy. He's up, you know. He's up, kind of in the referee's face, kind of calling for decisions, kind of stuff you don't expect him to do. He seems, he seems like he's really bought into it, which I I think a lot of Argentinian fans would say he he hasn't always done, even though clearly their best player, um, possibly ever or at least of a generation. But they kind of felt, you know. He was there, but he was in the, in that kind of cold, calculated way you might see at club level. This seems like a different mess. Not not the mess you see at PSG, and not even the mess you see at Barcelona. This this there, he seems to really want this. And when you combine that with the skills, which he still obviously has at thirty five, it's it's just fantastic to watch. Yeah, I know he definitely seems a little bit spiky. And then also, as you said, yeah, the way he turned what I it was probably been the best defender in the tournament inside out <laughs> in a in a tight space was was immense uh ray just on the, the what led to the second goal so croatia play a short or a corner short and not for the first time and given what we saw um again of argentina against against the dutch where they couldn't deal with you know height in the box did you find that a little bit strange the way croatia approached that like you know the set pieces yeah i mean listen i'd, I'd hate to be critical because i quite like invention, people doing something a little bit different, but you can't get caught out that easily. I mean, there was a lot of good fortune in the goal. I mean, there was two ricochets that went into Alvarez's path. You know, the first one, I think it was off Juranovic, and then the other defender was back there as well. And that's, he, he was sort of falling over um, and the ball popped up from, I'll tell you what he done really well. He could easily have handled it. Because when as, as it came up, it was one of them situations where he's gone near his arm he just adjusted his body beautifully to get it on his chest and then volleyed it beyond the goalkeeper. 
and for someone so young uh, as he is to finish it in the manner that he did was absolutely amazing and I just thought his all-round effort he's closing down he's chasing back hold up play running in behind because he knows Messi's not can't do that so he's got to be his legs if you like when, when it comes to them situations and I thought he'd done a magnificent job and it was such a huge goal because at 2-0 we said about Croatia, very talented technical side, but they lacked goals and it was really hard to see them come back. I mean, the Dutch came back against them from being 2-0 down, so it always gives you a little bit of hope that you could do it, but I just didn't see it. And they didn't have the big lads that, uh, you know, that certainly the, the Dutch had to, to come on and change it from that point of view. Point of view you know, yeah, so, they, yeah. I, I was just going to say, Raph, the, we, we thought the most furious debate of the evening would be the, the penalty and whether it was deserved or not. But it was actually seemed to be, looking at Twitter, it seemed to be whether or not Alvarez's goal was a good goal or not, or whether it was a lucky goal. I think it was a good goal, but it was, it's also kind of comic in a lot of ways. There's some good analogies, but my uh, personally, it was kind of dog a Jack Russell might score at the beach. It just kind of, <laughs> kind of has the ball in its mouth and just kind of keeps running and the ball keeps bouncing back to it. Uh, but as Ray says, for him not to either... You know, for one of those three touch, unexpected touches not to be heavy or not to be off his hand was remarkable. And then it was a very cool finish. Um, but I think, as you said, Raph, it was a little bit like a yellow pack uh, Maradona versus England in 86. Yeah, yeah, because I, I don't know, Ray, um, in terms of like how you define a solo goal. I mean, he wasn't in control of it the whole way through. He lost <laughs> it about two or three times before he volleyed it in. But he, won't, he won't care, boys, at all, will he? Because, <laughs> you know, when he... When when the when the tournament started, he wasn't playing. You know, it was it was uh, Martinez. It was up front. You know, and then he's got his chance. And it, my word, he's taking it. I think him and Messi really work well as a pair. I think Messi trusts him. He knows where he's running when he you know make, making the forward runs, and he's got that energy about him to get around the pitch, which um, can help defensively because it's, Messi's not going to do that. He's not going to chase back. He did do a couple of times, but not as often as you would like. Um, for the rest of the players, but I just I've just seen them grow. I've seen them play against Poland. I thought they were excellent. I thought they put on a very good show against them. Where never gave Poland a chance. Poland looked tired. Uh, they'd already beaten Mexico. So if you look at their run of form, it's something is it that one defeat in 41, 42? It's something ridiculous. You know, it just shows you that they've got a great strength of character, great mentality. I can only speak from um, being out here, but they're the best supported team here. You know, the Argentina fans in the, in the stadium are absolutely fantastic. The noise that they make, the passion that they've got. And when they beat, I think it was Mexico, the second game, they went over because they knew the enormity of it, having lost to Saudi Arabia. And the way that they just, you know, between them and the fans, there was this bond, a really strong bond about where the, the country was going and what they were trying to do. And I'm not surprised they've got to where they are now because of that bond. I don't think they've got the greatest of players. You know, when I look at them individually, I wouldn't say, oh, he's great and he's great. But it's a mass of them. It's just the, the work as a team. And then you've got this unbelievable player who can turn it on and do something incredible in matches to win you the game. Yeah, and Ray, I suppose um, there's a sense that they maybe are peaking at the right time, which is in tournament football, you know, sometimes we saw Spain peak very, very early. They went out. We've seen other countries uh, peaking at different times and and then kind of dropping off. But um, in terms of Argentina, do you think, uh, first, is it? do you feel this is, uh, this is their best performance and do you, do you kind of get this sense that they are growing? Well, I've seen them in other games where I thought they played very well as well. Now, I wouldn't say this is, you know, their best performance, but it's the most important one because it's gotten through to the final. And I think that's what we should be looking at is, you know, uh, they started slowly. You don't always have to start that quick. As long as you don't concede, work your way into the game. And then from there, you can take it on. And that's exactly what it looked like they they done. Um, got the goals at the right time. And you could tell with the Croatian players, you know, heads went down, shoulders slumped. I think they knew the game was up. Now, the, the tough games they've had before this, the tough games they had in the group, you know, that's where the damage was done. I think they only used 15 players or thereabouts, you know, in the starting 11s, where others were making changes because they could afford to do that. So they were freshening things up. Um, and that's where I'll give the, uh, the, the Argentina coach the heads up. He knows his players. I mean, he's a young man. I think he understands... You know, the, what their needs are and you know what uh, 
what's required. I think Messi's played every minute, isn't he? I mean, I, I can't remember him living coming off in any game. I'm, I'm trying to think through. Now, he, it just shows you because he's economy of effort, because he doesn't run around much. And people say, oh, he's not running around. And I always say, because he's in the best position. And if you're in the best position, you don't need to run. It's only I, I think Scaloni is quoted as saying that uh, he was asked, would he not take Messi off? And he said, I, I only take Messi off if he asks to come off. In other words, <laughs> I don't <what> say. <laughs> yeah, he's just, he's just, he's not going to take him off. He, he, he yeah. just knows, what, I'm not going to take the best player off. I'm not going to risk causing an argument with him or causing a feud. If he's happy, we're happy. So, I heard yeah. a story, you know, lads, that, um, Scaloni uh, got the players together and they trained without Messi to, to, to learn how to play without him. And then he brought slowly brought him back. And then the players, you know, then learned how to play with Messi. And it's worked to treat. That's great management. That's the art of, you know, knowing that if we've not got Messi, how do we play? And if we have got Messi, same thing. How do we play when we've got him? So the manager knows what he's doing. He's got it right. He's got a great backroom staff behind him as well. They, they all know the game. They've all played. They've all been there with them. Um, and the players have really responded. You can you see it more. You might, you're on telly, you can see bits. But, you know, when you're there and you're in the stadium and you're watching and you're watching where players go, like when they beat uh, the Dutch in the uh, in the penalty shootout, Messi ran straight to the goalkeeper, Martinez. Everyone else was all, you know, with the winning penalty taker. But Messi went to the keeper because he knew the importance of the first two saves that he made to give his team the chance to, to win and go, go through the semi-final. Yeah, because I think he uh, even after they won the Copa America, the uh, person he actually credited most was the goalkeeper, Emiliano Martinez. So I, I think it kind of goes to show how much he appreciates him. But uh, before we uh, you know, cast our eye towards the potential final and the, the matchup, which obviously would be either France or Morocco, uh, Ray, just on uh, Luka Modric, I mean, the, you know, he came off with about 10 minutes to go and... I probably thought it would be his last World Cup the last time when they were in the final. We've seen him again here at 37. He runs a lot more than uh, Messi does, of course, as well. And he has uh, he has a huge influence on this Croatia team. But just um, in terms of Croatia, I guess they'll look back when the dust settles. Obviously, they'll be in the third and fourth place playoff. But this is going to be a success for them, in a sense, getting to a semi-final, whether it's third or fourth. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, the final four years ago was absolutely incredible against France. And then to back it up, to get into the semi-finals, incredible. The only thing I'd say is, you know, where's the next generation of players? Because because of what they've achieved, you think more players in the country, got more youngsters, we try to become professional footballers. So I don't know the background. I don't know what the numbers are like. But what I would say is if, you, if you're looking at the team, you've still got Kovacic, you've still got Brozovic, you've still got Modric, you've still got Perisic. You know, and there should be one or two more youngsters coming through to maybe knock them out of position. But for Luca and what he's done as a, as a player, he's been absolutely magnificent for the last 15, 17, whatever number of years he's been playing. Um, consummate professional, gives you everything, every game in, game out, you know, keeps himself in brilliant shape. And, you know, the country must love him for what, for what he's done and what, what he's achieving. And for any youngster coming through, he's the one you should look at. You know, that, that, there you are. He's right in front of you. Everything he does, both on and off the pitch, is absolutely first class and I could can't speak highly enough about him. You know, he's a great player to watch. And any youngsters I say you you could try and imitate him on in certain things about what he does to become a, a, a really top player. Yeah, and I suppose Mikey for the final as well. Obviously it'll be either France or Morocco. We'll uh, we'll cast ahead to that very shortly. But uh, when it comes to who's gonna have that home match feel in it, uh I'd say France will probably feel like an away team. It will feel like they will be the away team if they do get to the final, given the support levels there. And uh, obviously, we've seen uh, Morocco's crowd seem to be uh, seem to be quite passionate, and they're in numbers like the Argentinians. Yeah, no, if, I guess from a neutral point of view, it will be very novel as well. Obviously, if Morocco made the final, and I think there's a lot of there's a lot of draw for them here to kind of the parallels that you could see. But a state that stadium, whatever it holds depending on the day of the week, it's somewhere between 80 and 100,000, whatever they give as the attendance. Um, if that's filled with Argentinian and Morocco fans, well, however many get tickets over the corporate tickets, that the corporate fans, that would be amazing. But also spare thought for the hosts. They're, they're guaranteed now that uh, 
their club entity PSG will have uh, representatives in the final. They'll hope for Messi versus Mbappe, obviously, but Messi versus Hakimi wouldn't be too bad either. So um, uh, it's a it's a so it's going well thus far for them. Yeah, and Ray, I suppose in terms of the final matchup and how Argentina would fare against either. So we know if it's if it ends up being Morocco, I mean, Morocco don't tend to have much possession, as we'll talk about a little bit later on, and it'll be sort of one sided in terms of who's uh, who's got the onus in terms of attacking. The Fran- if it was a France Argentina matchup, then that's going to be a lot more fascinating. Yeah, it would be. Yeah, um, because we know what the strength of the French side is. It's that front four, if you like. You know, Griezmann, Dembele. Uh, Mbappe and Giroud. I mean, Giroud at times looks like he's not doing a great deal, but put the ball in the box and he comes alive. You know, his goal scoring record for his country is absolutely phenomenal um, be- because he's going to get chances. Players will play the ball into the box. He makes the right mu- run. Someone will find him with a ball. But M- Mbappe's key. Um, he's he's one. Of, he didn't have a, his best game against England because I thought Walker actually masked him pretty well. But he was involved in the first goal. When he ran in field and got away, um, there was a couple of bursts of pace that he showed that you know was absolutely a re- electric. Um, and if they get through, I think it'll be a much tougher game for Argentina playing against France because France have got the experience of being there four years ago. A lot of their players, you know, played in that. Some of the players, should I say, played in that final. Um, but I just think they're the ones that are playing better than anyone else. What I've seen. You know, they're playing to a really high level in comparison. They had that one blip against Tunisia when they changed the team around. But I, I, I wouldn't, you know, worry about that too much. I thought it was a really close game with England. But England done well. Uh, but it was key moments. England didn't take the chances and France did. You know, the ball in from Griezmann for the second goals. As good as you only get is a cross. And Giroud was in there with a little bit of good fortune of the Harry Maguire. But it'll be fascinating. But just on Morocco. Wow. What a sensational story this is, isn't it? They have been absolutely brilliant. You know, for the manager to come in as late as he did to take over the World Cup squad, I mean, he had to speak to his coaching staff by his Zoom calls because they were all not on the, not on, all in Morocco. So they're all based wherever around the world. And they had to sit down and just discuss tactics and formations and, and players over a Zoom call. It just shows you what a wonderful job he's done. He's galvanised them. They've come together. You know, they've only conceded one goal in this World Cup uh, match he's so far, and that was an OG. So no one's really scored against them. They've been phenomenal. Great watch. Um, my fear for them is if they go behind. I'm not sure the sort of team that can come back from 1-0 because the French will then press it ahead and maybe get a second and probably be game over. Yeah, no, they've only conceded one goal in the tournament so far, which mm. was uh, which was an own goal. Um, yeah. So well done to that man as well for uh, <laughs> for, for breaking the way through. But uh, as we've seen in terms of, they haven't needed much possession at all to to work their way through. Spain dominated them. I think only Costa Rica have had a smaller share of possession than the other team uh, when it um, when it comes to uh, Morocco's games, and they only had twenty seven percent of the ball against the Portuguese as well. Um, as you said, Giroud is probably going to be key there. Does does he pose a sort of different threat than? what Portugal and Spain um, provided against the Moroccans? Well, see, with, with both, both Portugal and Spain, I thought they played too too slow. You know, there was a lot of, you know, passing backwards and square and weren't getting in behind quickly enough. Um, and, and in fairness to Morocco, they, they, they do that really well. You know, they've got pacey lads in their fullback positions. Um, Saiz is a great leader. You know, we've seen them at Wolverhampton Wanderers for a few years, you know, blind his trade in Turkey. Um, but he really is the one at the back there that uh, that can, you know, help out in them in that central defensive position. Aguerd didn't play in the last game; uh, he was out injured. He might be back. Masarui, the left back, um, big player. He didn't play in the last game either. So the manager's got some big calls to make as far as the team's concerned and who's going to play. But I just think there's a there's a confidence and a belief about them. I don't know if it's just one of them things, Raph, where you think, is it one game too far? Is this, you know, have they reached their goal of getting to the semi final, the, the first African nation to do that? They've got a continent weight on their shoulders going into this game. France have already won it four years earlier. So there's a little bit of pressure off with them to do it. They're trying to retain, retain the trophy. You know, Morocco tried to get there for the first time. And 
you know, the, the manager was even, I was reading before the tournament started, he, he was looking to build for the future. I mean, he was sort of, if we'd get out the group, we had Croatia and had Belgium in it, you know, that would be a milestone. That'd be fantastic. And now they've gone and beat Spain and they've gone and beat Portugal. And all of a sudden now all of Morocco and probably mostly Africa are all thinking, well, if you can beat them and you've knocked Belgium out in the group stage, then why can't you go toe-to-toe with France and, uh, and, and beat them as well? Yeah, and Mikey, I guess there's the sense they're going to inspire countries across the globe, the, the so-called smaller nations, which would include ourselves, I guess, as well. As Kevin Doyle was saying on the, the podcast yesterday, um, there was a sense that, you know, this it's something Ireland can take in terms of you don't always need to have possession when you're playing the bigger teams. You can counterattack cleverly, as Morocco have done. Uh, I suppose the only other thing with that is obviously Morocco have... Uh, a player who plays for PSG. There's another one who's with Bayern Munich, and then the goalkeeper has been a uh, European uh, trophy winner with uh, with Sevilla as well. Yeah, well, they're they're a bit like us. A lot of their talent seems to be concentrated into the full back positions. So you just <laughs> um, we're, we're just <laughs> Ireland's Ireland's two Premier League starters play in the same position of full back, and their their two best their two most well known players arguably are are full backs. But it's good that they have all that strength and depth in defence because. Um, it looks really like Sice isn't going to make it. His injury is going to keep him out. So Aguerd, the only goal scorer against Morocco in this tournament thus far, he's the guy who got the young goal. He'll probably come back in. Um, and Mazraoui will probably make it as well. So um, they do give us a lot of hope. And, you know, also, you know, they're kind of, you know, the reliance on kind of the, uh, you know, kind of the, the children of emigrants and, you know, kind of kind of getting people to buy in to Moroccan kind of system they built an academy and you know they're kind of trying to get convinced players to come back and play in the Moroccan league and obviously they have considerably larger population than Ireland which helps and they are football mad there's no other distractions for them so uh, I'm all for the parallels between um this Morocco team and your team in 1990 Ray but I, I think the parallels do run out at some stage but um they are they're a fantastic story and they have you know in Amrabat Ziyech Hakimi, Mazraoui, they've got four players there who are probably as good in their positions as anybody at the World Cup, you know, but they're obviously, they're coming up against a team who arguably have the best player in any position at the World Cup, although Messi might have made a case after tonight, but um, France, they, they do, as Ray said, they have the look of a team who've been here before and they've won it before and they were battered by England for 20 minutes in the second half the other night and, you know, they soaked it up they took it, they rolled their luck a bit, obviously, with the penalty, but they found a way to win the game. And, but we've been, we said that about Spain, we said that about, about Portugal. This Morocco team are a proper asset test for these vaunted European teams, too. Yeah, for sure. And uh, Ray, because we're, I, I did want to talk about penalties actually a little bit uh, just uh, just towards the end because there's some interesting stats around them, Ray. But uh, first off, in terms of the last thing on this uh, semi-final tomorrow, are you concerned at all about France's, you know, their clean sheet record in this tournament hasn't been great. In fact, they haven't kept one at all. Uh, conceded five, like conceded one goal in, in every game. And the game obviously was- the Tunisia game is probably the outlier because it was their reserve team essentially. But in every other game, they have leaked at least one. Well, what well, that suggests is they give you chances. That's what it says. Because just whether you're going to be good enough to take them. But the other thing to look at that as well is they've scored 11 goals in them five games. They might have conceded five, but they scored 11. But they've been really reliant on Mbappe with five and Giroud with four. You know, there's only Rabiot and Germany who scored in the other, you know, the other goals for them. And so Dembele's not come up there. Grayson's not come up with something yet, although he's been a provider uh, and he's been someone who gets around the pitch and puts his foot in. But it, they just look like they've got more options. So as far as I, you know, looking at the game, what I would say is as long as Morocco keep themselves in it for a long time, they might frustrate France and then hit them on the counter-attack. That's the only way I see them winning it because I just think with France... There's a know-how about them. Maybe the defence is a little bit weak. You know, I'm, when I've looked at them, you know, maybe they, you, could, you could get at them. I mean, I think a good matchup might be Hernandez and Ziyech, but I don't know how fit he's going to be because Ziyech come off in the last game, didn't he? And I don't know if he was, it was through tiredness or whatever, but he's key. I mean, they, the reason why the, the manager's in place at the moment is because Ziyech fell out with the old manager and they couldn't work him back into the team. So... Someone had to go, and it was the old manager that went. 
and the new one came in and said, well, how can you not play with Ziyech? You know, he, he's got to be on your side. So it shows you the he's a massive influence and a massive player for them. Uh, and making, I was looking through the team. Most most of the starting 11 who's played in these games weren't born in Morocco. You know, you've got lads from Spain, Belgium, France, Canada. Um, you know, the, the, the Netherlands, there's two, two or three from there. But when they play for the country, there is one. You know, there's this great bond between them. Um, they, they, they love being in each other's company by the looks of things. They get on, they're always smiling, but they are hard working. So if you've not got the ball, you have to work hard. And that's what they do, and they do extremely well. It's just the lack of goals, which would be a concern. That's why I see the difference between the two teams is Morocco might score one, and they'd have to score first because as they've shown in the game so far, only conceding one. And I think the last nine games in all comps, they've only conceded one goal. So it shows you they're overall very good. And then I was looking through, and the other, the other thing I didn't, this year I think the, I think the 17 or 18 games they've played internationally. So it shows you that you can get a lot of games together and then you form partnerships and you form understanding. And even last year, I think they played in 20 games. That's a lot of matches for your, for your country. And I think in the, I was looking up the last 42 games, they've lost three. One was a friendly. One was against Egypt in the African Cup of Nations, 2-1, uh, uh, I think Salah scored. And then they lost in another game uh, where it went to extra time and they lost on penalties. So that's not a bad run. That, that, that's a confidence thing for them. And they'll believe in themselves. It's just whether they believe enough up against the world champions and Mbappe in particular, if, if they can, you know, make sure that they can man mark him and maybe try and nullify him as best they can. Yeah, and we wouldn't put it past them, obviously, taking the game to extra time and penalties, which leads me to this, Mikey. So our, our colleague, Barry McEnany, drew my eye to this earlier today, and it was uh, stats that were in a Daily Mail report from before the quarterfinals. So at that point, 11 of 31 penalties had been saved during the World Cup. So that doesn't include uh, ones that have hit the woodwork or that were off target. Um, 42% of the kicks in the World Cup had been missed, which was down from 71 in 2018. And if we look at the save rates, uh, they've gone up from 17% between 1966 and 2018 to 35%. Obviously, this is not factoring in the quarterfinals and the and what we saw today with Messi's very emphatic penalty. But the, the suggestion, and I don't know from how you've seen it from the games you've seen, Mikey, but there, the, it, there is a sense that the goalkeepers are kind of staying on their feet a little bit longer. Obviously, there is that rule. They stay behind the line um, and they obviously sort of move forward with their motion as well. But also um, kickers want, uh, you know, the keepers to make the first move. And sometimes that might kind of play into it as well as a lack of power being taken. Yeah, I, I've i noticed I hadn't, hadn't uh, crunched the numbers, obviously, but it's noticeable just, you know, goalkeepers are getting better at saving penalties. Um I don't think that's entirely down to the individual, like the reflexes or the speed of the goalkeepers are improving at some exponential rate. I think it's, I think it's a coaching thing. I think it's a technical thing. I think it's, they do their homework. They know where players want to put penalties. Um, it's, it's a lot of combinations of things, but yes, they're definitely, definitely staying on their feet longer because, and I think you'll probably, the next World Cup, you'll probably see fewer of these stuttered walking run-ups. I think I said it on a podcast here last week that, when when Messi does no no one ever says Messi shouldn't do that walk up penalty or stutter stop penalty because he makes it look good and he knows what he's doing. There's other guys that do it and they're waiting for the keeper to go and they're waiting for the keeper to go. And as you said, the keepers aren't going because what keeper's going to dive if 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 the if the guy taking the penalty is walking towards the ball? You've got no you don't really need to make a guess unless you know he's not going to hammer it into the corner from a walking start. So they are staying on their feet a lot better. Um, and I guess you're looking at some of the best goalkeepers in the world who are like the likes of Lar like Larry Scott and Kane's head, I think. Kane was trying to do what Messi did this evening. Um, you know, there are some very, very good penalty takers. Yeah, savers there. Martinez is another one. But yeah, there definitely seems to be you're seeing fewer you, that thing that used to be so annoying when you watch the goalkeeper, and I used to do it myself in Gaelic football, you go the wrong way, but you don't even really dive because by the time you started to dive, the ball's gone the other way. So you do that kind of falling over, looking in the other direction thing. You see less of that now, which I think is a good thing. 
Yeah, and I suppose, Ray, you did that to uh, Silvio Lung 32 years ago now uh, in Italy uh, during the penalty shootout against Romania. Um, just you, your technique when you were uh, taking that, I think, and again, that penalty shootout against Romania. So you were taking Ireland's second penalty. Romania had gone first as well. What was your mindset going into that, especially in terms of how much power to put behind it and exactly where you were going to place it? Um, when I first walked up to take it, the goalkeeper put his hands out and touched either post and his head was touching the crossbar. So I was struggling a little bit to think of an area I could put it. <laughs> but my dad told me something when I was uh, very young. He said, when you take a penalty, just pick your spot and don't change your mind. And I think that's key. The, one of the biggest differences, I think, today Raph, with penalties is the players all know each other. The players against other, whether it be the Europa League, the, the, the Champions League, you know, whatever the case may be, they're playing against each other more than probably 10, 20, 30 years ago. So there's a better answer. It's a bit like Lloris and, and uh, Harry Kane. You know, he, he's, he's probably, you know, stopped penalties from Harry in training every week. So he knows his technique. You know, he'll know the little things that he does and he comes up to take it. You know, and then Harry's trying to second guess Lloris after he scored the first one. And, you know, what do I do? Where do I put it? Because... You know, is he thinking there? Is he thinking there? So I think there's a lot more, uh, as Mikey said, that goes into it than there was before. I think there's a lot more homework. You know, keepers and, you know, the technology that's around now, you know, they can put together a package for you and say, right, here you go. Here's where he's put them. You, you even see it in, you know, when you're doing the commentaries and you'll see it on the TV, they'll, they'll give you his last 10 pen or five or 10 penalties and where he's put it. So coming into the game, coming into the game, you know, the the coaching staff would have been telling the goalkeeper, yeah, yeah, here it is. This is where he goes. So you, you've got a chance to second guess what, what's going on. But um, sometimes it's just about putting your foot for it like Messi did today. You know, keep a guess is the right way. You can guess the right way, but if you hit it that hard, you ain't going to stop it. It's as simple as that. Yeah, because I've had this debate before, I suppose, a final point uh, with uh, Johan Naskin. So he, um, I did an interview with him about six years ago where um, like he would have taken the penalty for the Dutch uh, in the first minute of the 1974 World Cup final. And his thing, what he said to me basically was uh, his technique was just to hit it with as much power as possible. And then, I, I, you know, when you look at, say, the Japanese penalties against Croatia, the lack of conviction was uh, pretty stark in terms of they almost passed it right to the right to Livakovic. So where do you stand on the power thing? Because obviously you can put too much power behind it. But at the same time, you're if you do hit the target, you're sort of leaving the goalkeeper vulnerable because even if they you know, jump for the right me, way. The most, the most important thing when you're going to get is you've got to be confident. You know, because if you're not confident, you won't strike it properly. You know, if, you're, if you've got fear about taking it, then you're never going to be in the right frame of mind. You know, when you're going up to take it, you've got to think, I'm going to score. And the other thing I would say, and, and, and this is one of my bugbears about people who miss a penalty or free kicks that go wide is you got to hit the target because you, you're you nervous taking it. I'll guarantee you the goalkeeper's nervous if he's last minute of a game and he's, you know, there's a free kick coming at him. He's thinking, don't miss it. Don't flap it. Don't let it go under your body. Don't let it bounce off your chest. What happens if that happens? These are the things that are going through his mind. But when he sees it going six inches wide, 20 foot wide, he's thinking, no problem. So that's why it's really important to hit the target. That's why I can't understand when you, you know, put it over the top of the crossbar because, you know, you've not made the goalkeeper work. At least make him try and make a save. And if he does, oh, well and good. At least you tried the right thing. But to miss the target is is the worst thing you can do, in my opinion, from that. Oh, yeah, so Harry Kane, take note of those words. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But anyway, uh, that brings us to a close. France versus Morocco live on RT2 and the RT player tomorrow. And then we'll obviously have the third and fourth place playoff on Saturday and the big one then the final on Sunday. So Ray Houghton, thanks a million for coming on. And Mikey Stafford. Thank you. Cheers, Ralph.